Our next speaker is Professor William Marshner, who was a founding faculty member of Christendom College and associate professor of theology. He received his BA from Gettysburg College and his master's degree from the University of Dallas and STL from John Paul II Institute, where he is now a candidate for a doctorate of theology. Professor Marshner was a Yale University fellow studying Near Eastern languages and literature from 1965 to 1969. He is the author of numerous scholarly articles and is co-author with William Lind of Cultural Conservatism Towards a New National Agenda. He also has been an editor of Human Life International Reports. And ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who have not experienced a lecture from Bill Marshner, I guarantee you that you are in for a signal treat. Professor Marshner. Thank you all very much. Last time I was before an audience at an occasion like this, the computer had eaten my text and I had to wing it. And so everything was very clear. This time, the computer has eaten nothing. I have the text with me. And so things will not be so clear because uh, you know, all of my various technicalities are now in front of me in the text. I'm going to have to debug it as we go along so that it's all very intelligible. The topic is the moral difference between contracepting and practicing natural family planning. As you know, America is full of people who do not see any difference here. And the dissenting moral theologians within the church are very fond of saying there really is no difference. In both cases, the couple simply intends not to have a baby and the only difference is in the means, and there is no morally significant difference between the natural and the artificial. If it were morally wicked to do anything artificial, why have you got false teeth in your mouth? Even within orthodox circles in the church, there are many people who, while they admit with the church's teaching that a couple practicing natural family planning with a certain kind of intention is doing a morally good act, different from contracepting, they also accept that a couple practicing NFP with a different intention is really doing something selfish and wrong, which is very similar to contracepting. And then they face this problem. What exactly is the difference between the good intention with which the practice of NFP is morally good and that other intention? We've had this debate even among our own students and graduates on campus. There are many Orthodox Catholics who will take on faith the church's teaching that NFP can be okay, unlike contracepting, which can't be okay. But for the life of them, they don't see exactly when or with what intent it is okay. My hope here this morning, at any rate, is to clear up these areas of doubt. And to clear them up, I have to begin someplace a little further back. I have to begin with a question about which few of us have ever had two thoughts to rub together. This is the question of how do we classify human actions? How do we put them into kinds? 
Now, we're all familiar with the classification of things. We classify the articles in our houses into tables, chairs, sofas, and other species. And we're familiar with classifying plants and animals. We put them into genus and species. But how do we do that same thing with human actions? How do we classify them? Fortunately for us, the common doctor of the Catholic Church, St. Thomas Aquinas, had many thoughts to rub together about this question. And so we will turn to him now for guidance. To begin with, St. Thomas is perfectly clear that the classification of a human action has to be on the basis of what choice it is carrying out and not on the basis of the behavior involved. All right. Actions are classified on the basis of the choice they're carrying out, not the behavior involved. Let me show you why that must be so. Let's say that a certain housewife, God help her, is on the pill. And she's not a very tidy housewife. She leaves her anovulant pills lying around in the bathroom. Well, one day along comes her little seven or eight year old daughter. Maybe she has seen mommy swallow one of the pills. Anyway, she thinks it might be yummy and she takes one. Question. Have the mommy and the little girl performed any action of the same kind? No, is the answer of St. Thomas. You see, The object of choice is what determines the act. The mother has performed acts of contraception precisely by swallowing those pills. She's made a choice. She has an intention that puts her doing into that kind. The little girl, get this, the little girl is not practicing contraception. Okay. Is that clear to everybody? Is that obvious or what? <laughs> okay. So human actions have to be classified on the basis of the choice they're carrying out. Now then, given the obvious part, St. Thomas, as often happens, gets subtle. And he notices that when we state our choices, the proposals that we adopt by choice, we have two different ways of stating them. And as a result, there are two different ways of classifying human actions. The first text in which St. Thomas talks about the first way of doing so is from the Prima Secundae, question one, article three, where he says that an action is put into its kind by its proximate end. Okay. Classification by proximate end is the first way of classifying human act. This end is the agent's most immediate purpose in acting. And oftentimes, a statement of your most immediate purpose will not differ from what you ordinarily think of as, quote, what you are doing, unquote. Let me give you an example. Now, this is a very implausible example. But suppose I am washing the car. (laughs) 
I'm washing the car so as to get ready for a trip. Okay? Now, the trip and its destination are my ulterior purpose. And to get ready for it, you could say, is the intermediate purpose. But my most immediate purpose, my proximate purpose in acting is to wash the car, to get the washing over and done with. This is why I'm bustling about in the driveway with a hose. So we can call this purpose to wash the car E for end, W, C. End, which is washing the car. And we can say that it puts my bustling into an end-based kind, an end kind, which is to wash the car, which is washing the car. So this end classifies my bustling by putting it into that kind. It's an end-based kind. Does everybody understand that? Now, the other text in which Aquinas discusses the other way of classifying human actions is in the Prima Secunda, question 18, article 2. And there he says that an action may be put into its kind by its object. That's the object you're choosing to do something to. He calls it the matter with which the action deals, materia circa quam. Now, the best way to think of this matter is in grammatical terms. I mean, don't think of hunks of stuff. Think of the matter in grammatical terms. I start with the verb that would be involved in expressing what I am considering doing. For example, the verb wash. And I add whatever nouns or noun phrases would be needed to complete the expression of what I'm considering doing. E.g., I'll add my car. The complete expression, wash my car, is the object. It's the proposal I am considering adopting by choice. Okay. When I make a choice, I adopt a proposal. Now, personally, I never adopt this proposal. All right. But some people do. And there it is. The object is wash the car, and that's a kind of action. St. Thomas calls it genus ex objecto, kind from object. And we'll call that an object kind. Now, if these two texts of St. Thomas are to hang together, there are three possibilities. One would be that the kind from the end and the kind from the object are the same. And that's the most usual situation. My example of washing the car is an illustration of that, right? Usually, they're just the same. Every time you analyze your overall project into ends and means, your means tends to become your proximate end. To do the means, to carry out the means becomes your proximate end, and you classify your action from that, and at the same time, the means is the object. So that's very common. The second possibility would be that the kind from the end and the kind from the object classify on different levels. It might be that the kind from the end puts your act into its genus, and the kind from the object puts your act into its species. Now, that possibility does turn up sometimes. And if you're interested in St. Thomas's discussion of it, you will turn to the Prima Secundi, question 18, article 7. 
This situation turns up whenever there is not an accidental but an intrinsic connection. He calls it a per se connection between choosing this object and having that end. Okay? Although there are other objects that could be chosen for the same end. Let me give you an illustration of this type of case. Consider the end, the purpose, to communicate. To communicate. Now that's a shade different from to speak because there are other ways to communicate besides speaking, isn't that so? But it is intrinsically the case that one speaks in order to communicate. So if my proposal is to say thus and so, and that's what I choose to do, saying this will be an object kind of action and to communicate will be the genus, the end-based genus of that kind of action. Does everybody understand that example? And the third possibility would be that object kind and end kind both apply, but they're independent of each other, okay? Now that's very rare, but it does happen. St. Thomas gives this example. He imagines a Don Juan who's hard up for cash. To get some money, he decides to seduce a woman. He's going to, he's a Don Juan, remember, I told you that. So he goes about what he's good at. Now he's going to seduce her in order to steal her purse. Now usually seducing people isn't ordered to that end, is it? But it might be in an odd case. So for a Don Juan who's hard up for cash to adopt this project, we would say that his action was both one of seduction and one of theft. If we had to classify what this guy was doing, we would say his act was an act of seduction. We would also say that his act was an act of theft, wouldn't we? Both kinds apply, although they're independent. They're not necessarily connected. Clear? Okay. So to classify contraception and NFP, we must see now how they fit into object-based kind and end-based kind. Clearly, to practice NFP should be accepted as an object-based kind of action. The proposal adopted by the will is to use the temperature charts and so on and so on to time periodic abstentions. That's an object-based kind. Now, to use a contraceptive should also be accepted as an object-based kind. If you will, it's an object-based broad kind of which there are species like take a pill as a contraceptive use a condom as a contraceptive, insert a diaphragm as a contraceptive, and so on. Those are object-based species of an object-based kind. And it's very important that you use those words as a contraceptive at the end in describing this kind. The moral Orthodox moralists have always recognized that you can use a medicine that has a contraceptive effect provided that's not how you're using it. See? So, for example, if the doctor prescribes something for you to regulate your cycle or I don't know what, and that's the understanding with which you're taking that medicine, 
you're not guilty of practicing contraception. Right? In order to be choosing to contracept, you must be proposing to use this pill or whatever it is, piece of hardware, whatever it is, as a contraceptive. Okay? Is this clear to everybody? So now, the key question is this. Both practicing NFP and using a contraceptive are object-based kinds. What's the end? What's the proximate end? What's the end-based kind into which these should be put? Many people think that the end-based kind is not to have a baby. That the proximate end is not to have a baby. And I want to show that that answer is wrong. That is not the proximate end. That's not the proximate end in either case. Broadly speaking, one uses a contraceptive in order to prevent a baby from coming to be. Now that's an intrinsic connection. You cannot use a contraceptive as a contraceptive without intending to prevent a baby. It's further true that you can't intend to prevent a baby without intending not to have one. So the contraceptor does intend that a baby not be. That's a second strict or per se connection. So I don't deny that every choice to use a contraceptive is necessarily connected to the intention that a baby not come to be. But I do deny that this connection is immediate. It's not immediate, it's indirect. It allows room for the intention to prevent a baby, which is the genuinely proximate end of choices to use a contraceptive as such. All human acts of using a contraceptive, that's an object-based kind, are acts of the end-based kind, which is preventing a baby. Now, let's get clear what we mean by to prevent. Suppose you are worried about lung cancer, okay? And you, like me, have been for years a passionate smoker, all right? But that killjoy, the, attor the attorney, the, no, the surgeon general, is finally getting through to you. So you're worried about it. You're considering quitting smoking. And you might say that that's preventing lung cancer in your case, but that's a broad use of the word prevent and it's not what I mean. Let's suppose while you're in the process of this meditation, what to do? <sighs> There's a sudden publicity blitz and it's all over the television that they've come up with a new filter. 98% effective filter that you can put on the end of a cigarette, okay? Not these kind of filters that we have now, which as we all know are worthless and kill the taste. <laughs> <laughs> but a real, it, it works, huh? Then using that filter while smoking, is preventing lung cancer, and that's the sense in which I mean to use the word prevent. Let me give you another example. Suppose, like me, you have been for many years a long and a happy drinker, okay? Ah, whiskey, you're the devil. But once again, that killjoy, the Surgeon General, is getting to you, and you're beginning to worry about 
cirrhosis of the liver. All right? Now, you could quit drinking. Yeah, you could. And in a loose manner of speaking, you could call that prevention. But here's real prevention. Once again, while you're meditating, the ads come on the TV. They've invented a new pill. Such a pill. You swallow this pill, okay, and it does something inside your body to the chemistry of alcohol digestion, okay? It breaks into the process in such a way that nothing ever bad gets to your liver. Ha! <laughs> so now we have the possibility of taking the tablet while drinking. Now this is prevention in the precise sense in which I use the term. To prevent X means not to abstain from acts causative of X, but rather means to add a countermeasure to acts causative of X. All right. This is the sense of prevent that is understood by a person when he or she chooses to use a contraceptive. The person plans to perform sexual acts causative of a baby, that is to say, complete acts of intercourse as opposed to the Hollywood kind. And chooses to perform, expects to perform, intends to perform such acts irrespective of fertile and infertile periods. And the contraceptor chooses to perform another act which as a countermeasure prevents these foreseen sexual acts when performed from causing a baby. This is the sense of to prevent a baby in which all human actions of the object kind use a contraceptive belong to the end kind prevent a baby. And once this becomes clear, it's obvious. The proximate end for to which, for whose sake, every act of using a contraceptive is ordered is not and cannot be the proximate end for whose sake any act of practicing NFP is done. All acts of NFP involve abstention, like quitting smoking. We'll quit having relations during this period, like quitting drinking, like giving it up for Lent. That's completely different from planning to go ahead doing it with a countermeasure added. Furthermore, I believe that this end, preventing a baby, is the precise place to locate the contra-life will which is what makes contraception wrong. Now there are two ways of analyzing what's wrong with contraception that are widespread in theology today. And there's nothing wrong with either way. Some people think that the main thing, the principal thing wrong with contraception is that it's against chastity that it falsifies the marital act in such a way as to be first off against chastity. And I think that the present pontiff in his capacity as a private theologian is of that school of thinking. The other uh, strand of thought among good um, orthodox moral theologians is to see the 
the malice of contraception as first off its contra life character that's first off what's wrong with it now i belong to that party tradition for uh, that way of viewing things and also i think that this analysis explains the other analysis okay the very reason that contraception falsifies the marital act is because of its anti-life will. It falsifies the marital act precisely by adding a contrameasure against that very aspect of your life, your fertility, which is coming into play when husband and wife are doing their distinctive act. There's a wonderful passage in a book that I recommend by um, Father John Ford, Germaine Grise, Joseph Boyle, John Finnis, Finnis, and William E. May. Apparently they couldn't get enough authors. <laughs> but it's uh, Ford, Grise, Boyle, Finnis, and May. And the title of the book is The Teaching of Humane Vitae, A Defense, which is a good title published by Ignatius Press in 1988. And there's a wonderful passage in this book in which the authors are comparing the contra-life will of contraceptors to the contra-life will of someone who chooses suicide. Let me read this to you. Quote, Whenever a baby comes to be from a couple's one flesh communion, the new person is, as it were, an emerging part of his or her parents. Although contraception intervenes before any new person emerges, it is still a choice to interfere with existing human life. For in preventing the baby that they project and reject, those who choose to contracept attack their own lives as they tend to become one through the sexual act. By contracepting, they commit limited suicide, as it were. They choose to cut off their human life as they are about to hand it on, precisely at the point at which the new person would emerge. Unquote. Now, every word of that passage makes crystal clear sense, if I am right, that the contra life will involved here is the intending to prevent, to prevent a baby in that precise sense I defined, the countermeasure sense. Think of it this way. If we think of possibility in real terms rather than logical terms, the possibleness of any possible baby is identically the potency of the parents to beget. The possibleness of any possible baby is identically the potency of the parents to beget which is a real aspect of their existing lives. So a practical hatred of that possible baby is a practical hatred of the parent's own potency to beget. So that the comparison with suicide makes sense. And hatred is precisely, hatred of your own fertility is precisely practical when that hatred is directed against this potency when and as it is being reduced to act. 
In the very moment when your fertility is coming to, into act, you act against it by a countermeasure. That's the limited suicide. So this intention to prevent with a countermeasure is the right place to locate the contra-life will that is acted upon in contraception. Now let me give you two analogies which I think will help. Let's take the well-informed Mr. Smith. My analogy is going to concern truth-telling. The well-informed Mr. Smith knows an important truth, but he is loath to reveal it. He wants to bury it. Smith has a will to keep the truth secret. But perhaps that will only go so far. He's willing to keep silent, that is, abstain from speaking. But he's not willing to lie, which is to add a countermeasure to speaking. See? When you lie, you speak with a countermeasure that contracepts the truth from your speaking. Smith may be doing wrong in keeping silent. Maybe honesty even requires him to divulge this matter. He may be doing something wrong even in keeping silent, but as long as he keeps his mouth shut, He's at least not lying, and by analogy, not contracepting. Does everybody see the analogy? Let me give you another one. This one is drawn from playing poker. Now, Mr. Jones likes to play poker with a group of friends. Mr. Jones has had a long winning streak. Aha! There's the rub, you see. He's afraid that his long winning streak is over. <laughs> he doesn't want to give his friends a chance to win their money back. All right. Now, that may be fair, or it may, in circumstances, not be fair. Let's leave that aside. The point is, his will only goes so far. He's willing to deprive his friends of their chance, but he's not willing to cheat. He's not willing to put an ace up his sleeve or bring out a marked deck, although these countermeasures would prevent the losses he fears. Do you see the difference again between abstaining and playing crookedly. S Jones conceivably could be wrong not to play. There could be something wrong without abstention. I mean, this is really a friendly thing. His friends could say, you know, darn it, Jones, this is not fair. <laughs> Jones might even have a contra fairness will, <laughs> but it only goes so far. It stops short of being a will to cheat. And so, as long as he doesn't play, at least, he doesn't contracept his luck. I conclude that couples choosing to abstain periodically are never contracepting. They can have a bad will. But as I would argue, if I had another 45 minutes, <laughs> which I don't, fortunately for all of you, but if I did, I would argue that the wrong intention with which even NFP may be chosen is never simply the intention 
not to have a baby. That is never what makes it wrong to practice NFP. The simple will not to have a baby is not of itself a contra-life will. Take this comparison. Suppose we're children together under the same roof. And I will that my brother not have a toy. Huh? Doesn't sound too good, does it? But I will that my brother not have a certain toy. You see the analogy? A couple wills that we not have a baby. The brother, wi the brother wills that my brother not have a toy, okay? That is not necessarily a malicious will. Now it may be, maybe the reason I don't want my brother to have a toy is because that little twerp did so and so to me. So what we're dealing with here is an act of revenge. By the way, classifying actions by the virtue or the vice they're connected with, that's yet a third layer of classification that St. Thomas talks about. All right. He's aware of that too. I mean, there's an act of revenge. Oh, there's another possibility, however. Maybe I don't want that little brat to have the toy because I haven't got one. Then it's not an act of revenge, it's an act of jealousy. Huh? But wait a minute, there's still another possibility. I don't want him to have the toy because he'd put his eye out with it. There is the prudent brother's concern, see, to avoid a situation of injury. Now, there's nothing wrong now, is there, with my willing that my brother not have a toy. It's a matter of prudent concern. Now, the younger brother may, per may perceive this as highly inconvenient and meddlesome. <laughs> but there's nothing morally wrong with it. As a matter of fact, it's morally good. My point is this, simply classify, simply saying the intention is that the brother ha not have the toy does not suffice to give you a moral classification, does it? I just showed you three different possible moral classifications. In exactly the same way, the negative intention that we not have a baby fails to provide an adequate moral classification. Yes, it is possible that you will not to have a baby because you and your wife belong to the new church of Manichaean science that has been set up down the corner, and it's our doctrine that bringing new beings into the human race is trapping more souls in icky, gooey matter, and we're again it. All right? And our membership in the ZPG organization is on record and so on. We've got an ideological cause here. In a case like that, the will of the couple that holds the negative intent not to have a baby is further specified. It is a contra-life will. But there's another possibility. <sighs> Maybe you have bills to pay. Maybe you have an education to finish. And what you wish to avoid are other burdens that would be connected with having a child. You like babies, they're fine. The more, the merrier. But my will is set on being debt free. Or let's just say, having liquidity. Now this is just financial. I realize a lot of people think that financial motives don't cut too much. Those people don't keep a checkbook. And I don't deny that people can set too much store by their financial situation. Sure they can. We can all be tempted to dishonesty in that regard. But avoiding debt, staying solvent, is a very important consideration. And your will can be set on that. And the will set there 
is a pro-solvency will, okay? It's not an anti-baby will, it's a pro-solvency will. And yet you can still say of both couples, they intend not to have a baby, you see? A negative intention is short on logical power. It does not suffice to yield a moral classification, okay? Now, if I had another 35 minutes, okay, I would do in more detail what I just said I wasn't going to do, but did do in a thumbnail, okay? But my conclusion then is this. The will with which a pro-solvency couple practices NFP is morally good and in no case does even badly motivated practice of NFP ever ever count as an act of contraception. The will to prevent a baby is clearly different from the will to, sustain, to abstain and it is high time that the august teaching authority of the church which has given us the conclusions of my argument, should have brought to its defense the premises of my argument, so that Catholics can hold up their heads again and not say that all oh, the church is disti teaching distinctions that don't make a difference and so on. The church as a provident mother understands exceedingly well and has in her background the sophisticated moral tradition of the common doctor, all right? We have the answers to the world's questions. We can be proud of them. They are clear and they are cogent. Thank you very much.